Good evening, my name is Tom Brunton. I am the owner of Polymath PR. Um, I would like to just now circle around. So if all of our lovely guests could kindly introduce yourself. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that you spoke first. Yeah, I feel like I probably should now. Uh, I'm Tom Payton. I'm a writer, director, and a producer and very recently became the uh, managing director of a new studio in Coventry, England called Mosey Studios. Hi everybody, my name is Catherine Lynn Scott. I am an entertainment publicist both in the UK and the US and I founded the company London Flair PR. Hey everyone, I'll go. Um, I'm, my name is Minori Ravindran and I'm an international editor for Variety based out of London. Um, I joined Variety in January. Uh, previous to that, I was at TBI and Broadcast and then uh, before that, um, Real Screen Magazine in, in Canada. So thank you for having me. Okay, Hannah, you and me. Hi, I'm Michelle Koshman. <laughs> I'm also an entertainment publicist in California with a &B Publicity. Um, we mostly work with um, the Emmy Awards is our largest client, San Diego Comic Con, the Youth Oscars, and Hollywood Creative Academy. And I thought I'd hang about until last because I actually work with Tom Brumpton at Polymath PR <laughs> and I handle all the sort of digital side of things, the digital marketing and social media is where I tend to hang out most. Thank you so, so much for that, guys. Um, okay, cool. So I want to get started by kind of just discussing a little bit more. So I want to go to Catherine first. Um, what does a typical PR campaign entail? And what do, what as a publicist would you kind of expect from a filmmaker who are looking to hire you, be it for a short film or maybe for a feature film? Well, I don't think there's a typical campaign really because it definitely changes for each client that you have and you really, tailor it to each client that you have. I mean, if you had a film with uh, an actor that was uh, had a disability, then you would maybe kind of target, a lot of the press will be the same, but some of it will be different. So it, it really depends on, on, on the film, but in general, it's about really getting the film out there through uh, interviews with the media and reviews for the film. Um, obviously, if we we're working on the Oscar or BAFTA campaign, then we'd want to you know, make sure that that kind of media reaches BAFTA and Oscar voters. But you know, for, for when you're talking about uh, a film in a festival, you really want to get it out to you know to, to get as much coverage about the film and about the filmmakers because I think what often happens is the film the filmmakers get lost, especially in an independent film. You may hear about the film, you maybe don't know about the director and the producer behind it. So I think what we really try to do is get their names out there. So the PR is done for a reason, not just for um, that film festival, but you know to help their careers um, and their longevity of their careers. Wonderful. Um, Michelle, again, given obviously you do a very similar job to Catherine, um, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Anything based upon your experience? I know you've done, you've obviously done a lot with like the San Diego Comic Con, like you said, the youth Oscars and stuff as well. Um, from your perspective as well, because you're based in the US, um, what do you look for uh, when you're kind of running a campaign with, with, an, with an artist? Well, Catherine is absolutely right that it's going to vary depending on the client. And a lot of times that's because uh, a campaign has different needs. So you have some campaigns that are just about building consumer awareness or getting the attention of the festivals, getting the attentions of the, the merit awards. Then you have other campaigns that just want to get sponsors or they need to get traction as a studio or as a filmmaker. So a publicist will definitely work with the filmmaker and figure out what they want, but also what they need. And that's why every campaign is going to be a little custom. Wonderful. Okay. Um, Catherine, I just want to go back to you briefly because you mentioned before about um, if you're looking like an Oscar campaign or a BAFTA campaign, you've had an amazing run of success on the award circuit. Um, what the filmmakers look when what the filmmakers looking to do to work with you need to know when it comes to going after like a big award because there's going to be a substantial difference to oh my movie's playing at Sundance or Tribeca, let's get some PR behind it and I'm going to go and try and win an Oscar. What do you I mean what what does an artist kind of need to know when stepping into it into a campaign? Like that. I think it has to be a film that's on that level. Um, mm. Because I'm going to turn my phone off, it was just beeping. Oops. Um, because for me, uh, an Oscar or a BAFTA film is really, in essence, a feature. Uh, a, a film that's as good, if it's a short, it's as good as a feature that would be in, in theatres, you know, or up for the Oscars as a feature. Or, mm. you know, again, if it's a feature, it has to be a really good quality film in every single 
manner. Like from the moment you watch the film, you have to be into it in seconds. You know, it has to have great directing, great cinematography, um, a great storyline. I mean, I think, you know, when it comes to the Oscar and the BAFTA, in the past, they've kind of geared towards a lot of, uh, you know, people-led dramas and, and real stories that you can kind of, that get to your heart or that you can really, that, that will make a difference. But I think it's opening up to comedies. We had a comedy film um, last year in the Oscars. So it's about really having a product that is, uh, in short, excellent in every single way. And of course, when you're very close to a film, it's hard to just that. Because, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, there are really good films. There's quite a big difference between a good film and an amazing film. And there's quite a big jump in that. So it, it's really about, you may not even know if your film is right. And so you can approach people like myself and I'm sure Michelle, just to, to you know, say, what do you think of this film? Do you think I should go for it? And obviously a massive indicator is uh, winning an Oscar qualifying award. Because that, mm. you know, that really kind of says, okay, well, other people consider it to be at that level. So that's, I mean, that's kind of in short, uh, some of the things to look for. Okay, cool. Um, so something I want to kind of just push, push on a little bit there as well, because I imagine there's a, there's a lot of young filmmakers who are watching this, who are working on short films and stuff. What is the process for even kind of like, like moving forward with that? Like in terms of like looking to apply to kind of get in the long run, because it's never just a case of just like, oh, I have a short film. Okay, I'll go call this person and then they'll have a web with somebody else and boom, I'm a nominee. It's, it's nowhere near that, that straightforward. And from what I understand, going after a BAFTA, for example, trying to apply to join the race for a BAFTA, I guess, is a little bit easier than going after an Oscar. But I mean, your experience, like what, like, uh, what is like the process that, that we're going to go into like if you were kind of going after an award like that? Okay, with, if short, you're looking at like that. with short films for the Oscars there's two ways you can um, qualify. One would be to um, perhaps a more, more prestigious way is to win an Oscar qualifying award uh, mm. and there's about a hundred or so uh, festivals that you can win a, a, possibly win an award at to qualify to be considered. Um, or you can screen the film in a theatre and they've actually mm. opened it up to more places this year uh, because of COVID um, where you can mm. screen it uh, for a week in a theatre and you can qualify it that way. Um, mm. It could be, I think they've opened it to Miami now, um, LA it's always been, they've also uh, San Francisco, there's a lot more places you can screen to qualify. Uh, I mean obviously we'll have to see what happens with theatres actually being open in America, I think it would depend on the city. But those are the two ways that you could get into the first stage of qualifying mm. for uh, an Oscar. And for the BAFTA, it is a little bit more simple. You either have to be in one A-list film festival or two uh, B-list film festivals. And there's a list, the BAFTA list, which will tell you which ones. Mm. And you can qualify it that way. But also, I, I'm not um, totally up to, up to speed on this, but I think you also have to have a certain amount of a uh, UK cast because it's a British Oscar. So you need to have a certain mm. amount of uh, cast or crew to qualify. Okay. That's really interesting. And, um, and I want to I jump sorry. on to that too, Tom, that yeah, Catherine sorry, brought up a lot about learning your industry and uh, educating yourself. So there's a, we all know there's a lot of time and expense that goes into this process. So if your resources are limited, you can be more decisive. There are films that go out of Sundance and can are kind of different. And I can tell when someone says this was a Sundance film, I already know the type of film that it was. So mm. you can do your research and also find out, like Catherine said, out of these hundreds, which ones are mm. gonna speak more to this film and to me as a filmmaker, mm. instead of exhausting yourself and bleeding yourself all over yeah. the map, as much as you can, but you know, don't kill yourself in the process. No, I think that's a really, really valid point. Thank you for that, absolutely. Um, I just want to touch on something else that um, Catherine said, because you mentioned regarding, obviously, the situation with COVID, regarding the situation with theatres and stuff right now as well. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, Michelle, how has COVID so far affected you and your work? Um, how, what is, has it kind of forced you to do things differently? And if so, how has it kind of changed the landscape of things currently when promoting movies? So in 2019, when everything sort of revolved around digital and events. Um, mm. Now it's just more digital and virtual events, sort of like mm. this webinar. So um, the entertainment industry is still moving slower, but it's still moving. The press is definitely still going and people are even more savvy than ever before to researching and reading as opposed to just maybe partying or you know whatever the entertainment industry <laughs> likes to do. So yep. it's really kind of whittled down the key mm. players, they've sort of bubbled to the top, the people that are still going to persevere and keep working. And I think it's actually mm. made it better. So more mm. digital, more virtual events. 
That's very, very interesting. And I do agree with you. What I've kind of found in general, because you and I have had this conversation separate, but the general gist of the conversation we had had um, was that people kind of want to see filmmakers and creators and industry people kind of not so much taking advantage of the situation, but finding a way to kind of work around it because the crisis will pass. The situation we're in now will eventually will subside in some form or fashion. And once that's done, the dust has settled, I think people will kind of be looking around kind of going, okay, who are still doing stuff? Who's being proactive? Who's being productive during COVID? Because those are the guys and girls I want to work with. Those are the, I, want, I want them on my team because they've proven they can, they can function and, and still thrive in a crisis. Absolutely. It's been a reset button for the whole industry. Hmm. Um, Tom, this is what I'm going to pass on to you because as an independent filmmaker, you've had a solid run of success over the last few years. Um, and during COVID, you actually released um, your latest film, The Ascent. It's called The Ascent in the UK. It had like a hundred other titles that I'm not even going to try and rattle off. Um, but you and your colleague George had the wonderful idea to actually have the world's first premiere inside virtual reality. Um, and we had like a whole thing with like IndieWire and Variety. And by the way, Minori, thank you so much. Because Minori- Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about in terms of like what what kind of led you to that idea and also like like how it's kind of shaped your view kind of moving forward as an independent um as an independent filmmaker yeah i mean for, for me it's it's always been quite interesting i mean i'm i'm, I'm a real outlier in terms of you know the, the industry i think everybody's always trying to i i guess it kind of gets back to what Catherine's saying everyone's always trying to sort of go for the best prize. Everybody wants to be the next Spielberg or the next Cameron or the next, you know, uh, big indie director out of uh, Cannes or Sundance. And, you know, very early on in my career, I, I kind of decided, well, I'll try and be the next Roger Corman because no one's going after that. And, you know, that kind of sliced my market out and defined exactly where I was going to go. So I was always targeting the Comic-Con scene, you know, over uh, going, you know, kind of going towards the festivals. And, mm. You know, this year's actually been really interesting. So I've actually had two movies come out this year. One was The Ascent, which was this low-budget movie. The, the other was a film called G-Lock, which came out with Lionsgate. And we actually were at San Diego Comic-Con doing their virtual panel with that. So, you know, there were two kind of different budget levels. And, you know, we, we knew G-Lock was naturally going to get quite a lot of press and attention anyway. So we weren't stressing too much about the PR. There was, you know, Lionsgate got a very good PR team and... We had Stephen Moyer and Casper Van Dien. So these guys are kind of generating the buzz itself. But The Ascent was, was an interesting proposition because it's this kind of quirky, weird uh, indie B movie that, you know, it doesn't really fit the bracket for the sort of highbrow press. Uh, and it's very sort of mainstream orientated. And so we very early on were like, okay, well, this, this movie needs something more to make people, you know, pay attention to it. And then we were already kind of heading down the track of this virtual reality uh, scenario when COVID hit and it shut all the cinemas down. And so really by thinking outside the box, we, we managed to generate a lot of PR for a movie that probably would have, you know, kind of just splatted onto iTunes and Amazon without much fanfare. But what we did was we realized there was a sort of growing, uh, you know, sort of social media base within virtual reality that nobody's tapping. And I think everybody always thinks of virtual reality as a, a, a gaming platform. But actually, you can fully build cinemas in there and you can have hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world pay ticket prices and enter these cinema events. And the theatrical experience in virtual reality is very similar to a normal um, you know, cinema experience, apart from you actually are in your own home. But the screen appears the same size. You can see all the other people sitting around. Uh, the only good thing, there's a benefit to VR, is you can mute everybody. So you don't have to listen to people talking. Um, but you do get these cool little emojis. So you can see how people are reacting to the film in real time with these emojis. So I think it was one of these situations where we kind of, we utilized a, a growing platform. And we realized, you know, if we were the first out the gate, if we're the first people to do this virtual reality premiere in a, in a VR cinema, that's newsworthy. That's, that's PR worthy, you know? And I think it's, I think, you know, that's kind of been one of the things I've always tried to do with every movie is, you know, I, I don't think about the film as just this, oh, I've made the movie, oh, now what? You know, from the very beginning, we're, all, we're already planning, who is this marketing to? How, where are we taking it? What will the posters look like? What's the, what are the PR gimmicks that we're going to deploy to make sure the audience comes to this stuff? And I think it's why I've been able to make six films in, in the turnaround time that we have. And, 
And as of this current moment, they're, they're all doing well. Like none of them are flops. So, and it's down to PR. You have to think about this stuff. I want to touch upon that a little bit in terms of what you said, because and there's two things I want to touch on. The first thing is that when we did the virtual reality premiere, um, you'd, you'd already met um, Eric Cohn, who's the um, editor from IndieWire. Now, you got in, now Eric was literally just in Altspace. We, he was just yeah, we, met, it, we, met, we met him in virtual reality. So, you know, we were, ha we were hanging around in virtual reality, like planning this stuff. And, you know, this guy kind of rolled up and was just talking to us about film. And we got talking and we're like, hey, yeah, we're going to do this VR premiere. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm Eric from IndieWire, which is completely mm -hmm. random. But you, you'd be surprised just how many people are in virtual reality right now. And it's very, it's very hard to explain to people that aren't actively using it. But it's very mm -hmm. similar to Ready Player One. You know, there's this big hub where everybody kind of ports in and they have their avatar and they're just talking. You can just talk and interact with people. And I think that the power of virtual reality is in social media and that lends itself very well to cinema. And I can sort of predict a future where it doesn't replace theatrical, but it layers on top of it. You know, so you have screen times at the same, like Odeon will have its own virtual reality, Odeon or AMC mm. chain cinema in VR. So the option is there for you. If you don't want to venture out and sit with, you know, 150 people for real, well, you can still pay the same ticket price and do it in virtual reality. It doesn't have to supplant the other. They can work in tangent, you know? I agree. I think the benefit of that to, to something like doing um, a, 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 basically a VR cinema, I think, is that if you, for example, live in the Highlands of Scotland or if you live in like a really remote village um, and there's just no way, if, if you wanted to go watch this film, like say uh, Roma, when it first came out, which didn't have a massive wide release, um, obviously before it hit Netflix, um, you might not be able to do that. There might not be a cinema chain near you that you can physically access. So I think having access to, a, to an alternative is really, really cool. And you know, watching the Netflix is great. Netflix is awesome. But I think something you and, and I discussed before was this idea that it wasn't about supplanting cinema. It was about creating a communal environment for filmmakers to kind of thrive within. Um, and the reason why I want to go back to Eric is because Eric actually went on to, for the premiere, he actually did a Q&A with you as well. Mm -hmm. and wrote this beautiful extensive piece about the prospects of using virtual reality as well. So by, by, going, by going to him with this idea and kind of saying, we have an idea, do you want to do this? It opened up lots more avenues and it opened up lots more coverage. And off the back of that, that turned, that turned a, a, as you said, like a, a relatively small project into this, into this thing that had much wider coverage that otherwise it may not have gotten. Look, I mean, you have to, as a filmmaker, especially if you're independent these days, yes, there is always the chance that you're going to end up at Sundance or Cannes good for you if that happens but it's it's highly unlikely you're gonna that's like but you know you're in the one of the two percent of the of filmmakers if that happens to you but it doesn't mean you have to you know i think the problem is people take like huge amounts of money from investors and they pile it into their passion piece without ever stopping to think how am i going to sell this and if you don't sell it then that movie won't make money and if it doesn't make money you won't get to make another film and that's really just the reality of it you know so you you really have to be thinking about these things and you know for me i was doing that right off the bat you know my first movie was you know a tiny budget 50,000 pound film made in the woods and the the reason it made money i could see that if we took it the traditional uh, release route it would it wasn't going to work and uh, at the time there were these subscription boxes, you know, these like mystery boxes that you could, you, you would buy them for like, you would pay like 29 99 a month and a box mm. would show up and you don't know what's in it. You have like Loot Crate and companies like this. There was a really big one here in the UK and the US and uh, we went to them and we said, hey, we'll put the film inside your box. It feels like a valuable product for your customers and you just mm. give us £1.50 per, per, you know, film code. And they said, yeah, sure, we'll have 90000 please. So we're already in profit before we get going, you know, and it's things like that. And they did all the PR for us. And by, by that happening, the Comic-Cons became interested in the film and it became this little PR snowball. And that opened up the doors to me to carry on. So like, if you're not thinking about PR stunts and you're not working with a PR team off the bat, you're probably in trouble is, is kind of my, my opinion on it. So. Mm. And I think as well, I think there is that kind of sense you need to be a little bit creative and a bit crafty, I think as well. You have to kind of think slightly outside the box. Um, the interesting thing I want to kind of point back to is something you'd said before in terms of like you're, you're look, you've always looked at the long game because that calls back to what Catherine had previously said. This idea that we're not just promoting a film, we're promoting a director, we're promoting a producer, we're promoting a, an actor. And I, I'd had a conversation with somebody from Warner Brothers recently and the conversation basically alluded to that 
if a studio is promoting a film or a, a TV show, whatever it might be, unless you are the name actor, they're not always going to push to try and get you interviewed. No. That's kind of on you. You need to make sure that you're taking advantage of that because if they want you to do stuff, that's cool. But it's not their job to promote you. It's it's your job to promote you at the end of the day. And I went again, pointing back to what you what what Catherine kind of said about promoting the director, not just the movie. I think it's really important to make sure that with every project, you look at it as a piece of the whole, not the end game, as it were. Well, that, that, that kind of, yeah, exactly. And that kind of goes back to what we're saying, how, you know, I think a lot of filmmakers, they approach the product as, well, I got the investment and all I have to worry about now is making the film, which, you know, it should be your main priority. But at the same time, the, there are so many more component pieces to this, especially if you're hoping to launch a, a career that you can stop doing another job and you know you can do this full time you know then you really have to be thinking about the machine as a whole and where you fit into that and how you're going to be promoted and, and that unfortunately means either getting a really good PR team or getting very good at it yourself you know get used to going on zoom calls when people ask you and you know don't be afraid to to approach things like comic-con and say hey look I'm good at what I do and I'll keep people entertained for an hour and they're like, okay, well, that's great because there's, there's value in that over a bigger name because you can get big names that are boring as hell, you know, and they'll kill the room for an hour where they know if I come on and tell a load of jokes, that, that'll probably keep people entertained. And I get a lot of PR for my movie out of that. So mm. I, think it's, I, think, I think it's trying to forward plan and trying to think about, okay, well, what's your brand? How do you want to be seen? Who are your market? And how are you going to engage with them, you know, long term? And, that doesn't necessarily mean having a giant social media base. It means having an active one that follow you wherever you go, I think. Mm. I agree with that, absolutely. Um, this actually brings me to a, a different question. This one's from Nori. Um, in the age of social media, in an age where we're kind of seeing businesses and magazines and stuff kind of shut down every month um, all around the world, how, in your, how does traditional media still play a vital role in 2020, um, as, as, in, in, your, in your opinion? Well, I mean, you know, I have to say, like, for us, it's been, um, I, I, we've certainly seen our traffic just, it's like this, you know, because as people, especially during this period, it's kind of, mm. no one's, no one's going out, everyone's in, you're not, you know, you're not necessarily, even the, the print version of Variety, you know, some of those magazines are basically going to people's offices. So, so for mm. example, our website is seeing, um, you know, seeing incredible traffic, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, I feel as though, I mean, of course I'm biased. Um, I love our brand, but I do feel as though um, some of our reporting has been, there, there's been a, an added sense of urgency to some, to some things. I get a lot more feedback perhaps than I used to, like, oh, this was super important. This was like a lifeline. Like you guys are like a Bible to me during this period. Um, I feel as though the, the press and, and certainly what we do and what we've been covering is, is probably more and more vital than ever. It's, it's certainly harder. Um, but I mean, I have to say it's been, it's been challenging. I think it's been challenging for, for journalists during this time, because I think, and I feel so badly about it because, and I genuinely do, um, we have been inundated. We, I think probably since March, it has been so, uh, so, so challenging to, to, um, to, to cover everything that's been going on. Uh, we've been doing our best, but there's so many different avenues. It's just like, it's new for the industry. It's completely new for us as well. So we've had to really innovate and, and think very differently about like, you know, every single aspect of, of this industry, looking at, looking at it through a completely different lens, um, which, you know, which has taken some time. I think we're kind of in a good groove at this point, but, um, but you know, it, it has ultimately, I think, meant that we have had to be selective about, about what we cover sometimes, which is, is you know, which is not easy. Um, there's so many worthy pitches and projects that come through, but um, but ultimately we've really had to to focus in on um, on what we're able to do because of also quite frankly our resources too, um, mm -hmm. and you know who is able to to cover some of these things. So it's been sorry that's a that's a very long answer, but um, I do. That was wonderful. The answer, you know, I mean, I genuinely do think that we've been um, providing a service, or at least I hope that's always our our goal. Certainly, in terms mm -hmm. of some of the more practical. Um, coverage that we that we do. Hmm. The interesting, the, I think the interesting vari variation there as well is that um, American media is slightly different to British media in the sense that we, so like Rolling Stone, Variety, Vanity Fair, The Hollywood Reporter, we would typically kind of associate these things largely as entertainment magazines. 
but they're very different compared to say Empire or Total Film Art, for example, in the UK. Like it wouldn't be weird to see like a political article on Rolling Stone. It wouldn't be weird to see some kind of financial expose in Variety, for example, as well. Do you find that, again, speaking, uh, again, working for that, for, for a publication like that, an American publication, do you feel that's helped? And do you feel that allows filmmakers to maybe kind of tell us a more diverse, different stories? We kind of go, well, this isn't, we can't review this, but we do have this section over here this fits in with the kind of thing we're doing over here. Do you find that the, that allows longevity for, for a publication, but do you think it also kind of allows more room to, um, to kind of help promote worthy causes? No, absolutely, for sure. I mean, I think that that broadening out, um, you know, variety is very consumer facing, you know, in, in recent years, it has simply become more consumer facing and that's part, partly to do with market forces and, and whatnot, but it's certainly worked in, in our favor, I think. And, and absolutely, you're right. I mean, pitches come in sometimes and, um, and the, the scope is simply is simply wider and you know we can we don't necessarily need to think of it in a very sort of strictly kind of very very hard industry um, angle all the time you know I mean obviously that's that's kind of what's guiding us always that's always our impetus but you know we can kind of craft it in, in certain you know in different in different ways I mean there's some things that obviously we always have to abide by but um, in, in other ways absolutely there's a there's a greater flexibility I think um, for some of the types of, of stories and features that we do. Um, you know, we have to be careful, obviously, in terms of protecting our brand and making sure, sure that it is uh, still very much, uh, you know, has those clear demarcations of, of what people come to us for. But, um, mm -hmm. but I do think that there is, it, it is a flexible brand from, and, you know, I've worked mm -hmm. in various places and I, I would say that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so my next question kind of pertains a little bit to what um, Catherine and Michelle were discussing before regarding the award season stuff some of the the bigger publications tend not to directly cover short films so you'll have like smaller publications and webzines and blogs and stuff some podcasts they will happily cover they'll review a short film or they'll kind of go into a certain filmmaker um if if someone was coming to you and said okay we've been in telluride or we've been in uh toronto for example um what kind of coverage realistically could an outlet like variety provide on that when it kind of comes to like the best shorts that you need to see this year, the shorts that are doing the best this year, what kind of stuff does variety tend to do for those, for those kind of, those kind of filmmakers? Um, well, I mean, I have to say it's, it's, um, it's challenging. I mean, certainly on the, the U S side, I think it's, it's a little bit, yeah. it's maybe a little bit different on the international side. A lot of, of what we do is very much connected to the, the festivals. Um, obviously we have sort of e-show dailies and, and whatnot. And, um, uh, you know, then that's a slightly different team, but we all, but we all do work together. Um, and it's, it's, um, I, I guess I would say, I wish that we could do more for some of those, for some of the, the, the shorts from, from that, um, you know, kind of thinking about that angle. Um, but ultimately we do sort of rely on some of these festivals uh, to be our gatekeepers, um, simply because of the, the volume of, of content that we, that we get on a daily basis. And it, it really is like a madness sometimes, but we, but, you know, we sort of look to certain, um, certain festivals as, as sort of providing, um, providing stamps of, of approval, um, that makes our job, um, a little bit easier. And I think it's partly is to do with trust as well in terms of, um, you know, we need to make sure that there's certain standards that um, that are met and that we can, you know, that we that we have some faith in in terms of in terms of what we're then able to, to cover. Um, sure. It's uh, it's it's challenging. I mean, on the short side, I, I you know, I, I wish that uh, I wish that we could do a little bit more on, on the international side. But but sometimes, you know, we do have to peg it to a certain festival or we have to peg it to a certain event um, sure. instead of doing more kind of evergreen stuff, unfortunately. Like, for example, uh, you kind of go, okay, so um, the 10 short films that you have to check out at Toronto, the 10, the five short films that you need to see this weekend at Cannes, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my last question for you on this topic was, um, you, you, as you've said, you get stuff from people like myself and Michelle and Catherine all the time. Um, if, a, if a young filmmaker or if a publicist was looking to come to you with something, what draws you in? What, what, what about a pitch draws you in? What do you look for and go, okay, I need to investigate this a little bit further. Like, what are you looking for? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, I, I've got a few notes um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because quite frankly, um, you know, we, 
like I said, like there's, there's a lot that, that comes in. It's not just, it's just me. It's, it's a lot of journalists, especially during this time where it is, mm -hmm. it is, it is crazy. Um, a strong news angle is something that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very news driven in my job. Um, I need to have a strong news angle and this can basically be, um, it can be a few things. It can be, um, established IP. And again, it's kind of playing into that thing of, of some recognizability and, and trust and, and um, accessibility. So those are things that you need to think about in terms of what we're looking for. Um, so established IP, talent is another thing um, in terms of a, a direct, people track records effectively. So um, a director that's, that's somewhat known um, or has done a project that, that, you know, it doesn't need to be, it can be someone who's on the way up, but like if you can point to like, oh, hey, they were at TIFF and they won this award or they got this recognition or something like that. Like that's, that's important. Um, uh, or, or obviously uh, cast and, and sort of talent that, that way. Um, I would also say something that's topical, you know, it doesn't sometimes, honestly, like I feel as though I, I you know, kind of having come from a documentary background where, you know, I started real screen and, you know, I, I have a lot of, um, I guess, appreciation for, for sort of, projects that are made on on very you know very very small budgets and I, I really love um kind of flying the flag for those projects and I understand how difficult mm. it is to to make this kind of content um mm. and in terms of talent it doesn't always need to be about talent if you have an interesting hook for a project or if there's mm. if there's just a really neat story or something that's topical or political in mm. some way that you know you're able to um that that is pitched to us effectively um mm does that does spark our interest you know but ultimately um you know there needs to be sometimes uh like i guess recognizability some sales potential too, international sales potential that's very important um i think you need to kind of think about the business side of this um in terms of a film uh you know it, actually we get a lot of ex kind of like trailer pitches uh, especially around the the festivals and things like that and it's increasingly our policy is like well we need we need to ensure that we get the sales uh, news as well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's that, that, that sort of thing, basically. Thank you. Um, there was an interesting point that you touched on there because you'd said that, that you do like to champion the underdog effectively. Um, Michelle, I want to bring this to you to say because um, um, in the, in, I know in the past that you have said when, when you kind of had discussions and stuff, you, the, 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 an issue that I think some filmmakers kind of have, not all, but some, there's this kind of sense of like, okay, well, there's the BAFTA crowd or there's the BFI crowd, and then there's everybody else. And I think there needs, I think there needs to kind of be like an acknowledgement of just like, no, everyone wants everyone to win. If you've made a good movie, the world wants to know about it. People want you to succeed. No, no I, I've, 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 I've spoken to, to, to people in the past, this kind of sense of just like, okay, but um, the, there are gatekeepers, there's this, there's this. I think it's really important to kind of point out that if you've got a good idea, people want to hear about it. And I think it's really important to kind of that, that part of PR is taking that good idea and making sure it's put in front of the right people. Absolutely. Remember that a huge amount of the entertainment industry is about networking and it's about mm -hmm. making industry contacts that hopefully you make into industry friends and mm -hmm. the, the right people of the industry will recognize that. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, um, I was with Catherine Lynn Scott at Chaconis, and she said, I don't know why people view this as a competition. We should be helping each other. So you develop that mentality. You find other people that have that mentality, whether they're press, publicists, whether they're talent, uh, industry, don't try to get something. Make friends, industry friendships out of those people, and eventually, organically, the right people will be able to help you with what you need. So it's not about getting, it is about giving, and the key players of the industry recognize that. I totally agree with that. Actually, I would say, um, to be honest, like I've made some, some, you know, some of my friends are work in, um, in public relations and, you know, we're, it's, it's, it's not, they've become friends because, you know, it hasn't always been a very aggressive, like, oh, we need this coverage and, you know, what can you do for us? It's, it's more like, hey, you're, you know, uh, even when I was starting out, it was like, oh, you're new to the industry. Like, let me, let me sort of show you around or let me, um, let me kind of fill you in on, on certain things. It's sort of like, especially for, for new journalists, I would say, like, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good opportunity to kind of help people on the way up and um, kind of cultivate relationships that, I mean, ultimately we're just people really. And I think um, if you can kind of help each other and connect on a very human level, um, I think that does help because you're so right, Michelle, it is very, this, this whole industry is relationships focused. Um, you know, you have to sort of be able to, to just kind of connect and, and, and help one another on, on that level, on that plane. 
And I, and I think as well, it's a sense of like, it's, 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 it's having the confidence to kind of make that initial phone call and not fear that you might stutter or say the wrong thing. And then that person is going to completely like disavow you forever. It's like, no, I mean, everyone's human. At the end of the day, if you have something really important, something really good to say, people want to hear from you. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you've done. If you have something great to contribute to the conversation, please like throw, throw your name in the ring as it were. And I, I, I agree completely with both of you in the sense that, um, if I, I don't know about you, I, I do suffer with, with anxiety a little bit. And if I'm going to an event of any kind, like if we were doing this in, in public, for example, in, in, in person, um, my eyes would immediately dart to the people in the room who are going to go, okay, those are my friends and you know, these guys over here. And that reassures me. So it doesn't matter if I'm a guest or a speaker in an event, that puts me at ease. And I think that people kind of sense that as well. And I think that the more people you have in the room with you, the more confident you feel. And I think that's really, really important. I think when you are, um, doing some stuff when, when you are doing that kind of stuff when you are kind of when, when you are trying to kind of get into the industry remembering that everyone wants you to win but at the same time um, it's okay to kind of it's okay to not always get it right as it were people want you to do it okay um, I want to take this now because talking about networking stuff I want to move over to social media stuff and Hannah um, hello um, I wanted to ask you how can a filmmaker define their social media voice because I know this is something you talked about a lot in the past yeah, this is probably the thing I spend most of my time talking about, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of finding your voice, like I kind of go back to a point that Tom actually made earlier on, um, in that one of the things that he does when he approaches places, whether he wants coverage or to speak there, is he kind of lets his personality show, you know, uh, and Tom, I've met you and spent time with you, and you're a very bubbly person, very funny, and that can across as well in your online presence and that's something I'd encourage everyone to do. Take a little bit of time to uh, step back a bit and look at yourself and think well okay well who am I as a person and who am I in these projects that I'm putting out there because I think every piece of media that you put out into the world there's a part of you in that and I think sometimes you need to sort of step back a little bit and take some time to think about that. Um, and again, as, as pretty much everyone here has said, if you go into it with forethought, because if you try to go online with a persona that doesn't fit you, and then a person meets you at an event or is with you at something like this, and they tell you, you're so different in person, it's kind of like a big disconnect then. And, mm. and you run the risk of seeming disingenuous as well, which you never want to come across as in the industry. You know, I think a lot of us, um, I think we've all had to deal with someone who's a bit like that at some point. So mm. it's about really thinking about who you are, what your values are, what you're bringing to the table, and also just genuine passion. You know, what are you passionate about? I think the biggest thing, and we've all said it at different events, is like, we're all in this industry because we're huge nerds. We are massive nerds. I mean, uh, I work with Tom and we cannot go a day without a Marvel or a DC reference. That's who we are no, when it comes yeah. to doing our work. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so that should be coming through in your online presence as well, you know. Um, Tom, I, I can, can I just can I <laughs> yeah can I can I just add something to to what you were saying, Hannah? I think that because what I don't want people to think is that you know oh you have to be extrovert and bubbly mm. to to get ahead because that's <laughs> that's not that's not the case yeah. and. I think you said a word that really lines up with what the, you know everybody else was saying, especially when it comes to making friends, and that's is to just be authentic. You know, it's like mm -hmm. don't like like who who I am online is exactly the same person in real life, and you know I, I'm playing to my strengths uh, as a as a person. But you know, just be, just because you're introvert doesn't mean that you can't play to those strengths, and there isn't a fan base that you know will follow you because that's the kind of stories you're going to be telling. It's the kind of experiences mm -hmm. you're going to be having. And if those are showing then and they're resonating with an audience, they'll follow you just as much as some bubbly guy, you know, who's extrovert and makes popcorn movies, which is kind of what I am. Like there's <laughs> it's it's not about it's it's not about trying to 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 make yourself into a show. But it's just about saying, Hey, look, this is the kind of person that I am and that'll tell you a lot about the kind of movies that I make and you'll build an audience yeah. up. And I think if you're trying to if you're trying to, if you're trying to make movies for somebody who doesn't reflect you, if you're trying to appeal to an audience that you just don't mm. associate or identify with, you, you mm. will fail. 
You know, like if I tried to make art house movies that went for those Oscars, I would tank immediately because I can't do it. I'm rubbish at that. So I know not to try, you know, that's just not, it's just not the way to go for me. But if you're an introvert who makes these very sort of delicate dramas about, you know, social issues and stuff and you target that and you're genuine and authentic, that will resonate too. And you just have to be who you are. I, I would agree with you completely. And the, if someone else is talking, we all have thoughts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, have I, want, I want to throw something into that Minori said uh, a little bit ago that your track record is going to be reviewed. Social media is the one place where you can literally control 100% of that narrative. Yeah. Social media is selling without selling, and where you're building your brand behind the scenes, educational, um, fun facts. Anything about you uh, that strikes your fancy in the industry or that you're working on, you're sharing that and you don't have to be bubbly and extroverted. You're sharing these little bits of information and they, they say it takes about 25 to 40 touch points before someone actually buys into you and believes you. So when you're active on that social media, you're getting those touch points out and even better, someone responds, that's a warm lead, that's a fan or a sponsor or a distributor, that's, that's a, a, a press, a new press friend. So social media activity doesn't just have to be about yourself. That's an opportunity to share slash educate and that's gonna build your brand to where now other people wanna work with you. I would agree. And the, the, interesting, the interesting conjunction I wanna make here in between, um, between um, Catherine and also with uh, Tom is obviously they, may, they, may, they there's a chance they, they are kind of promoting very, very different films. And as, but as such, they both know exactly who to talk to. If Michelle is, sorry, sorry, sorry if Catherine or Michelle are kind of working a big awards movie, then they know who to go and talk to. But at the same time, if Tom is putting out a film, he goes, okay, well, I can go talk to Sci-Fi now. I know it's got to talk to the guys at Total Film. I know there's like, here's like an army of like 30 um, bloggers and podcasters who cover horror films and stuff. It's really, really important to know who you're talking. Because if I, if I went to say like a Sci-Fi fan with a period drama, they might kind of go, yeah, this is cool, but I have no idea what to do with it or even what to say about it. And the, the reverse is so. Um, and I think that that's a really important point that needs that people kind of need to kind of get across. Sometimes a rejection isn't because the film is bad and simply just because the journalist just is the wrong person to, to talk about the movie. Um, I just want to touch very quickly. This is my last question because I'm looking at the clock and I know that Jess is going to hop in in a few minutes time. My last question here um, is, and this, this is a broad question. So this is a free for all. So kind of you, you're all kind of touched upon this. So go for it. How can social media play a role in effectively promoting a movie? And this is, I asked this question and I run for cover if you want to kind of leap on that. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on this one. I am, um, I have filmmakers say to me all the time, uh, oh, you know, I don't do social media. I don't like doing Instagram. It's not me. Yeah. Um, but you have to look at it as, like you were saying, it's a free media tool. And it's mm. huge. I mean, w when we were working with a silent child that won the Oscar, uh, mm. the short film that won the Oscar a few years ago, we we came up with a campaign through social media that uh, the tag was uh, um, uh, disability, well, I think di disability is diversity, because mm. there's a young girl in it that was uh, deaf. And we used this tagline and got everyone to take pictures with the tagline, and it really, really went viral. And I think that this is free, it's something you can do, it's something that you would just you know, start off with even just asking friends and, you know, to build it from there. But I think mm. for me, I, I, I massively think that had a big role in helping us win the Oscar for that film. So if you, if mm. you really kind of think about the right type of campaign, the right thing, to, I mean, even if you're not sure, you can just try different things and you'll soon know what works. So it's, mm. it's definitely something that is it, it, huge in, in, um, in, in any, even for film festivals. It, it's a really big part of letting people know about your film, as you've said before. Mm. I would just also sort of add just very quickly that, um, especially during this period um, with COVID, journalists aren't really getting out that much. <laughs> and to be honest, <laughs> a lot of, it's just, we're just not. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of stories that we have sourced through social media. We're on it all the time. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Um, and, you know, people send us links or, uh, or we find them organically. And um, I just, I'm, I'm always amazed when um, filmmakers aren't on social media. I think that's a very, um, I mean, I, I find it shocking to be honest, because that is exactly as you said, Michelle and Catherine, that is your platform. That is your direct voice to us. Um, that's how we know how to reach you and, um, you know, that you're carving out your identity. So I think it is extremely important um, 
for for yeah for for new and emerging um, filmmaking talent to to do that because that is we do notice um, and if you get critical mass around I mean you if you if you're you know, there's certain events that we see on social media or, or certain kind of like lightning rod topics around around um, a certain film or project and and we do notice like these things uh, generally come across our, our radar and. Um, and we know how to get in touch with you. So please, please get yourself on social media. Um, I think that's, that's, that's in your interest. I, I think the other thing I'd probably add to that as well is um, if, if you think about certain directors who are very visually striking, let's say um, Nicholas Winding Ref from Adele did the Neon Demon and Only God Forgives. One of the things that first kind of strikes me about a director like that is he's got a very, very visual style. And Tom, you, again, you have a very visual style. If you, if you look at a lot of the, the stills and stuff from your films, they're very striking visually. Um, there is a very good chance that just on those beautiful images alone, those really striking visual images, you're going to draw people in because there's, there's going to be something that catches their eye, even if they, they'd never heard of you before. Just kind of seeing you in the mix with that visual style, just that one Instagram post can just pull in a few more people to kind of check out your project and get behind your work. So I do agree with all of you that I think not having a social media account but being a creative in 2020 is, is very, very counterproductive. Um, I have something, Tom, that maybe is a question, but I think will be really, really useful for filmmakers, especially those Please. starting out. Sure. I think that what uh, filmmakers often don't do because they don't know is to think about the material they may need for press. I think Tom touched on this when you're making the film, not afterwards. Mm. So it's such a big thing. It's so big. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it really is. Do a little, uh, do a short film with the director directing, you know, doing something in the scene, great behind the scenes pictures, but more importantly, having great stills. If you have a small budget, it's worth putting it into, um, into actually having great stills because when it goes to PR, you know, my, my tools to get to like Minori with the film would be a great, you know, obviously a good story, a great press release, but it also has to be great stills and a great trailer and a good poster mm -hmm. because those are the things that vis visually catch the eye from the beginning yeah. and then we make people go, oh, I want to read that press release because that looks really mm -hmm. good. And I think I've, I've seen some brilliant films, you know, really Oscar quality films and they've come to me and I've looked at the materials and I'm like, but this doesn't match the quality of your film. It looks, it looks too dark, it just doesn't look right. So I think these are things that no matter what budget you're on, whether it's a big, big budget or a small budget film, you should consider it when you're um, making the film. It's been, honestly, that has been one of the, the, the main reasons I think that I've got to make six films in such rapid procession. And it's because we were constantly thinking about the EPK from the beginning. And I mean, we, we just started our own sales company inside the studio. So we're handling our own sales now. We just cut a really great deal with Shout Factory. And I can tell every filmmaker watching this right now, if you don't have 50 stills from your shoots, if you don't have them, you won't sell that film because they are part of your deliverables. Like that company buying your movie will eventually take it and PR it and take it to people like Minori and yourselves and, and say, hey, do you want to run an article on this? And if you don't have the stuff from set, if you didn't provide down the lens stills, if you didn't get behind the scenes, mm -hmm. if you don't have a director's commentary track that you put in your deliverables, if you don't think about these things, if you don't get it behind the scenes, mm -hmm. let alone PRing your movie, you won't mm -hmm. sell it, period. So you have to do these things. I would agree. And I think as well that if you are, for whatever reason, struggling to come up with some interesting stuff, if you're struggling on the visuals and stuff, bring in a designer, bring in people who can kind of help bring that vision to life. You don't have to try and do everything yourself. I get that when you're kind of first starting out, there's not an awful lot of money there, which is understandable. But I also think as well that if you are, if you feel that you're rushing through anything, any point in time, stop, just slow down. The world doesn't know you exist yet. Okay, you might have a great film and you might be desperate to kind of get it out there. But I think at the same time, if it's not quite ready or you think you're rushing through something, stop, take a breath and then go again. That's but what's, what the, what's the point in making a great movie if mm. you can't sell it? And you can't sell it yeah. if you don't have the PR assets. So you have to get no. a photographer on set and you have yeah. to get a behind the scenes guy. They're like non-negotiable. Yeah. If you're making a short yeah. film and you're thinking about not having those, don't make the film because you, yeah. just, you just won't sell it. It's as simple as that. No. That seems I agree with that. Um, guys, thank you so very, very much for everything. You've been wonderful. Thank you to Hannah. Thank you to Minori, Catherine, Michelle, and Tom. I just want to pass back over to Jessica now so she can uh, step in with your questions, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Tom. We've got some, oh, we've got quite a lot of questions now showing up in the <laughs> box. Um, we'll do our best. Yeah. So as the conversation's been going, they've been, they've been flooding in. 
Uh, so let me just pick a few. Um, Martin's asking about um, trailers and um, if you have any advice on where to place uh, trailers on the web. Uh, well, from my experience, like I've always used, I've always gone to people, um, there's big YouTube channels with, with huge subscription bases and they're mm. a very good place. If you can get your trailer platforms with those guys, if you get in touch with them via their Twitter accounts or whatever, you can very quickly rack up 85,000, 100,000 views and that will put you on the radar of the bigger press that then might consider running, running that trailer because they'll see, well, mm. people are engaging with it. So that's, that's how I do it anyway. Mm. Great, that's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, Isabel is asking, well, she, it's quite a long question, but I'll go, I'll go through it, here we go. Um, most of the information for building up your social media platform as a filmmaking pr or production company are geared towards companies that have something to sell. What are some specific goalposts we can have with our media platforms for a short film production company? What should we be aiming for? Um, what are the practical outcomes of building a social media audience for newbie production companies? Does anybody want to take that one? <laughs> Multi I'll take question. a piece of it. I love that question and I love how deep you're going with this. It's actually really impressive. Um, but again, remember that for every project, people love exclusive content. That's something that traditional press can't provide. So as was mentioned, get good quality, but don't skimp either on quantity. So anything behind the scenes, table reads, auditions, um, sets, building the sets, tearing down the sets, not necessarily pose people, oh, we just signed the contract, here's the handshake, but maybe some of the grind of the project, people love that. If your film has an educational or a, a, some sort of um, ethical message to it, fun facts, um, or, or your, you know, what your message is trying to do. This is selling without selling. So promote every one of your cast members, their lives and what they're doing. Give them love, give them props. So quantity, a good amount of quantity is gonna build. Remember, you're building an audience who now is gonna transfer over to a sellable audience to distributors or ticket, ticket purchasers and fans. That's great, thank you. Um, lots of practical advice there. Uh, Rodney Charles is asking, if my fiction film falls into a minority category, black, socially progressive, elevated drama, how do you advise locating appropriate, passionate PR companies when there are so few successful examples of PR behind this type of film, especially if we discount having a huge company like Plan B come in after the fact? Do we have to seek a niche company and do they exist? Yeah, you know, publicists, generally are looking for a good film and mm. i wouldn't put out i wouldn't i would consider every genre um because a film can be good in in, in, in whichever form so i don't think you necessarily have to, to to source source somebody niche but just go to somebody that's experienced in working with independent film and then you know if they if they love it i mean i wouldn't get behind any film unless i totally love it um mm. so if they're passionate about your film um, then you know that's the person to go with you know and obviously has you know great reputation etc so I think it's about maybe reaching out to a few people I mean you should interview publicists like you interview a manager or you know don't go with the first person speak to a few you know you go with the person that you feel is right for you and that will easily come across in, in a short time but I think don't be afraid to, to send a film to a publicist and I'm sure Michelle will be the same and also you know Tom if we don't connect with the film then we you know we'll, we'll just let you know it's not for us but don't be afraid to approach people. I, um, Hannah and I kind of have a policy where much like what Catherine just said if we don't vibe with something we will outright say it's not for us but if we feel that it's not quite if we if we if we have kind of thoughts and stuff we, we try and be as, as constructive as possible and we would rather not take on a project that wasn't right for us that we didn't think we could do a good job with than just take your money and run um, I, and I think and I agree I agree completely with, with what Catherine just said um, and I think as well, kind of look look at the kind of work they've done because the thing is, if, if you look at most most film PR companies, their work will probably be very be very varied. As Catherine said before, she worked on comedy, she worked on dramas and stuff as well. So there's a great there's a great sense of variety. Then if you feel like you vibe with the person you're kind of talking to, great, that's a great start. Um, but I think it's also that what makes you feel kind of comfortable when you're talking to that person. If you're going to invest in this person, give them thousands of pounds potentially, 
and work with them for the best part of a year, you need to know this is one that, that, that you can trust and who's got your back and has your best interests at heart. Thanks, Tom. Um, got a question from Val saying, um, I'm not familiar with Comic-Con as a place to release films. How does that work? Well, you wouldn't release your film at Comic-Con, but you would, you would garner an audience for it, you know, especially in terms of, let's say you're, I mean, some of my earlier stuff, you know, these days I'm fortunate and things tend to get picked up far in advance, but those early movies of mine where you were looking for international distribution and you're trying to sell that thing to certain territories or you're trying to make festivals, you know, pay attention to it. Um, Comic-Cons are very passionate, almost fever pitch audiences that, We'll get behind something if it strikes a chord with them. But I mean, they're very, they're very, you know, sort of orientated towards science fiction and horror, um, that kind of genre. So it's not right for everything. It just happens to be right for the kind of movies that I've been making. So. Yeah. And while you're talking, Tom, I've got a question for you from Paul Butler, who um, has a, a question about how you come up with your great PR ideas, um, mystery boxes, PR. <laughs> big fan of you and your films. Uh, well, thanks, Paul. Um, I, in, I think it's just like it's trying to be innovative. You know, it's like it's paying attention to you know the kinds of stuff that Variety are reporting on or that they think is newsworthy, and trying to find a way to make your small little unheard film newsworthy. That's the point, right? You're trying to make you want people to know about it, and to, for people to know about it, it has to get press, and for it to get press. Mm -hmm. It has to have something about it that differentiates it from every other indie film that's made for sub one million. And that's just about, you know, keep your, keep your finger on the pulse of technology, of innovations that are happening within the industry and try and be the first one out the gate. You know, the big companies will do it, but if you can just nudge ahead of them, well, you get the press. To kind of follow on with what Tom's saying there, I think that I think something else that's worth considering considering is like consider the audiences. If you want like total films kind of cover you or Empire or Variety or whatever it might be, like he's just said, see what they're covering, subscribe to them. Like literally, yeah. literally just, just pop in the newsletter, like get the newsletter through, see what's coming through, a quick glance, oh there's this, this, and this, make a few notes, go, okay, that's cool for later, hug it away, come back to it another time. Something I tell a lot of my clients as well is I always say like, um, be aware of the zeitgeist. Like what's everyone talking about right now? You know, if there is a way you can kind of hop on what's kind of current, what's kind of going on right now, you can ride that wave and get something cool from it. Um, but, and again, the, th and the thing is you can turn something relatively small and something quite big just by paying attention to what's going on in the world today. That can be really, really helpful. So yeah, absolutely. I actually can't, um, just to pipe in, I, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of, um, there are a lot of pitches that we get sometimes where um, people simply do not read the content. They don't really read what it is we do and they're not on top of what we've been covering. Um, and it shows, to be honest, because you can you can tell right away that someone's kind of maybe hasn't really kept their eye on, on you know, what it is we're producing. So I think if you really want to be in a certain outlet, read that outlet read it um, religiously, um, sign up for all the newsletters, make sure you're getting all of the, the newsletter alerts. I mean, uh, outlets like Variety and uh, on the trade side, obviously, uh, Variety, THR, Deadline, we put out so many newsletter alerts and, um, you know, they're effective, but you should be, you know, if you, if you want to be um, someone, the subject of, of, of that coverage, I think you need to know the types of things that are obviously getting that platform. Um, I think that's, um, a big, it's a very small thing actually, but a lot of people, uh, I don't think they really keep up with the media as much as maybe they should. And um, I just, I, I think my, my, you know, that's a, that's a big piece of advice for me. Just, just if you want to be in the press, read the press. Um, it's mm. very simple. And if I can throw in one also little cherry on top, remember that there's um, key words that will tantalize the press. If you are the first to host a virtual reality premiere, if you are the biggest Etc. You are the first. You are the known most. There, there's an actor that's known for playing President JFK more than any other actor. What a weird mm -hmm. thing! But it's it's a little it's a little cherry on top that the press goes. Oh, this is the first, the biggest, the longest running. Whatever you can find that makes your project unique. Definitely, I, I completely agree with that. First is very important. Um, you know, because a lot of uh, outlets like ours, we're you know we're keen on the exclusives. We want to have things um, initially. We want to be first out the gate. That being said, also please always be honest um, because you know um, <laughs> make sure that you have that. We you know you need to kind of have that trust between um, between various parties and and just be upfront. Um, ultimately, we 
you know, we need to, we have certain standards and we, we want to make sure we're putting things out there that are, that are accurate and that, you know, because we have a, a readership that, that obviously trusts us and, and what we're putting out. So please always be honest as well. Um, even though we are very keen to be first, we are also very keen to be accurate and to, you know, to be trustworthy and we don't want to lose that ever. So just something to keep in mind. Well, I think, I think just adding to that real quickly, and I'm sure, I'm sure that everybody on here is going to agree with what I'm about to say, but the actual filmmaker side of things, there's a lot of ego, uh, unfortunately. And, and the, the problem is, is I think when a lot of filmmakers are approaching their PR, that they're so in love with the thing that they've made that they're convinced that that's the story. And, you know, like just if we take the VR premiere, for instance, that Minori ran an art, article on, I was completely aware, hey, I made a film that I think is cool. No, no one cares. That's just the way it is. Like, and I'm, I'm all right with that. But so I was accepting that, okay, this movie needs something. And we got out there with that VR premiere. That's the headline. World's first VR premiere. You know, and embedded in there somewhere is, oh, it happens to be this film directed by this guy. Great. That's the, that, that's the bit of PR that we needed. But, you know, if you're running with something, well, you should just take, you should just run this piece because my film is great. Well, that's, that's just not going to work, I'm afraid. That's just not how it is. And the other thing I say as well is that I think um, is that typically, and I, I, again, I don't think I'm alone saying this, when I get an article or, or, or a thing through, I will speed read through the thing initially and my eyes dart to, to, to specific words that I kind of, I will kind of recognize if I see like say Netflix or Can or Warner Brothers, whatever it might be. And my eye kind of goes back to that and I'll kind of reread past the whole thing, kind of take it all in. So if you are kind of trying to kind of promote your film, kind of push something out there like that, make sure that when you're kind of putting stuff in there um, and you're kind of, re you're, you're referencing things that you know is going to kind of catch people's eye and catch their attention. Because if it's just like a bland page and a half thing about how great your movie is, people are going to, they're, they're, they're not going to read it. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to tell you, but people will when they're speed reading things and they're kind of going through lots of different information they'll kind of pick up on the information that's interesting to them so if you know that you're trying to appeal to people like minori um it's important to make sure that the stuff in there that's again that's relevant to the to, to the publication of course 